Hello and welcome back. We are in chapter 11 of Materials Kinetics, which is Morphological Evolution in Polycrystalline Materials. Uh, the outline for today is that first we're going to cover uh, the driving forces for morphological evolution. Then we're going to deal with the simple case of isotropic surfaces, then go to the somewhat more complicated case of anisotropic surfaces. Then we're going to deal with the topics of particle coarsening, grain growth, diffusional creep, and sintering. So we've got a lot of topics to cover today in morphological evolution. Uh, but first, what is morphology? So every real material has at least one interface. It's free surface that interacts with the outside world. No real material is infinite, even though oftentimes we make the assumption of an infinite material. Um, in reality, there's always going to be at least one interface, this outer surface of the material. The morphology of a material is a description of both its macroscopic shape, so it's a description of both its external surface, as well as its internal microstructure, such as grain boundaries, grain orientation, sizes, and, and so on. And the morphology of a material, meaning both the microstructure and the macroscopic shape, can evolve in response to driving forces that seek to lower the free energy of the system. Uh, this morphological evolution encompasses changes to the free surface of the material and its internal interfaces because they both contribute excess free energy to the system. Anytime you have an interface, that interface constitutes some sort of mismatch between the bonding of the materials on the two sides of the interface. So there's always a free energy penalty that is associated with having an interface. And morphological evolution seeks to um, adjust those interfaces or evolve them in some way to lower the overall free energy of the system. Now, there are two main driving forces for morphological evolution in polycrystalline materials. Those are capillary forces and applied forces. Uh, capillary forces are the forces that are associated with decreasing the total free energy associated with interfaces in the material. This includes both the free surface as well as any internal interfaces. And we calculate that the, by calculating the um, free energy associated with all of the surfaces or interfaces. And that is simply a summation over all the different types of interfaces here, I. So this would be a summation over all the free surfaces and all the interfaces here, I. Um, associated with each one of those interfaces is a surface tension gamma sub I. The surface tension is just the free energy per unit area associated with that interface. And if we multiply the free energy per unit area by the area, then we get the free energy contribution. So the gamma times A is the surface tension multiplied by the area of that particular interface. And then we sum up over all the different types of interfaces I, and that gives us the total free energy associated with interfaces. Now, if there's an opportunity for the material to change its morphology to lower the overall free energy of the interfaces, that is what we call a capillary force. So the capillary force leads to a decrease in the total free energy associated with material interfaces. And that is um, intrinsic to the material itself or internal to the material itself. On the other hand, applied forces uh, come from external sources, uh, for example, performing mechanical work on the system. If you apply, say, a shear force or a compressive force or a tensile force, uh, all of those contribute to the driving force for morphological evolution, and the material interfaces can change in response to those applied forces. So if you add these up, add up the capillary forces and the applied forces, that would give you the total driving forces for morphological evolution in the system. So let's begin with the simplest case, which is an isotropic surface. Uh, this would be uh, dealing with the morphology that's just in terms of the external surface of the material, so neglecting any internal morphology, and assuming that there's no directionality to the surfaces. In other words, that they, they are isotropic surfaces. Uh, in this case, the analysis is simplified since the surface tension gamma is independent of the crystallographic direction. 
Uh, an isotropic surface with local changes in its curvature will evolve towards a geometry with a constant mean curvature. In other words, it's going to evolve towards a geometry where the curvature doesn't change with respect to position. And if you have the same curvature for all positions, that is geometrically a sphere in three dimensions. And a sphere is a way to minimize the amount of um, surface area per unit volume. And therefore, if the system evolves towards a spherical shape, that minimizes its surface energy. Now, the kinetics of surface evolution depend on the particular atomic transport mechanisms that achieve the necessary surface motion, and these mechanisms can include vapor transport, surface diffusion, or diffusion through the bulk crystal. So if we start with the simple case here of having a surface that has some sort of undulations on the surface, so there's some roughness to the surface that could be described uh, by some function here h of x, which just represents deviations from a flat surface. Maybe it's a sinusoidal shape or whatever shape it is. It doesn't particular, particularly matter. Um, but the flux here of atoms along the surface is going to be given by uh, two factors. There is the thermodynamic driving force here on the right and the kinetic factor here that involves the diffusion coefficient along the surface. Now, the driving force is the surface gradient operator here, uh, this gradient operator with the subscript surface operating on the surface curvature kappa. And what this operator does is it takes a uh, kind of a two-dimensional gradient of the curvature at that particular point on the surface. So in other words, if you were at a particular point of the surface here, it looks in both directions along um, the surface itself and sees how the curvature of that surface is changing with respect to um, moving along that surface. So as long as there is a non-zero surface gradient operator, uh, that means that there is a thermodynamic driving force um, for a flux of atoms on the surface in order to rearrange um, its structure until it eliminates any uh, gradient in the surface curvature. And the way that it eliminates the gradient of the surface curvature is to have a constant surface, surface curvature at all points, and that means evolving to a spherical shape. Now, another place where, um, where this arises in isotropic materials is at uh, grain boundaries. So if instead of having uh, just dealing with a free surface without any grain boundaries, if we just introduce one grain boundary into the material and still assume that this is an isotropic material so that the, the directionality doesn't matter here, uh, now there are two relevant surface tensions. There is the gamma sub B, which is the surface tension along the grain boundary here. So it's acting along this direction. And then there are the, um, the surface tensions here, gamma sub s, which would be the surface tensions between either of these grains and the free surface of the material here, gamma sub s. And the, the thermodynamic equilibrium is not having this um, kind of square boundary here between the grains. Um, this will actually evolve to have some sort of groove, grooving on the surface in other words, forming this dihedral angle here, psi, and the equilibrium dihedral angle is based on a balance of the surface forces acting in both directions. So if we balance these surface forces with respect to this angle here, psi, uh, the balance is achieved with uh, the cosine of psi over two is equal to uh, the gamma sub b over two times the gamma sub S. And so uh, this grooving is a natural result of, of a system, even an isotropic system, um, that leads to this surface texturing by formation of this dihedral angle, uh, just as a result of balancing the forces between two different types of um, surface tensions. Now, another place where we get morphological evolution uh, in the isotropic case is in the stability of a cylinder. Um, for example, if you have some uh, cylinder of a material here that is subject to perturbations, and those perturbations have a wavelength of lambda, 
if you if you satisfy the appropriate condition for those perturbations, this cylinder can actually evolve into a sequence of spheres. And um, the way that we see this in everyday life is if you consider uh, the stream of water that comes uh, off of your kitchen faucet. So if you've got your kitchen faucet and it's open to have um, you know, a large intensity of water coming out, you're going to have a very thick uh, cylinder there, and it's going to be a continuous cylinder of water that comes down from the faucet. However, if you turn the water pressure lower, the uh, cylinder is going to become thinner and thinner, and eventually it becomes so thin that it's no longer stable with respect to the fluctuations of the air molecules that are randomly uh, perturbing it. And at that point, the thin cylinder actually breaks up into droplets. So if you make this thin enough, um, the cylinder will decompose into droplets, uh, and that's just a way of minimizing the free energy. And the key to this happening is that there must be a continuous pathway of lowering the free energy with respect to those perturbations. Now, the condition for this happening is, is called the Rayleigh instability condition. And this is satisfied if the wavelength of these perturbations here, lambda, is greater than some critical wavelength, which is equal to the circumference of the cylinder. So 2 pi times r0, where r0 is the radius of the cylinder. So that is the circumference of the cylinder. And if the perturbation here is longer than the um, circumference of the cylinder, then uh, the cylinder is unstable. And there's a continuous pathway to uh, evolve its morphology into a sequence of spheres. So that's why um, you know, the thicker cylinders of water under high pressure are more stable compared to the thinner cylinders that arise if you reduce the water pressure uh, in your kitchen faucet. So any perturbation uh, with a wavelength less than the circumference of the cylinder will not grow, but the perturbations that have a wavelength greater than the circumference of the cylinder will grow. Uh, and that's because if the perturbation wavelength is longer than that, then that means that there's a continuous pathway to lower the free energy of the system as it evolves from a cylinder to a sequence of spheres. Now, there is another uh, wavelength that is of interest, and that is the kinetic wavelength, which corresponds to the maximum growth rate uh, of the spheres. So on the y-axis here, this is a measure of the kinetics of this morphological evolution, or a measure of the growth rate of the spheres. And on the x-axis here, this is the wavelength of perturbations. And what you can see is that there's a zero crossing point where if the wavelength of perturbations is less than that, the cylinder is stable. Um, this means a negative growth rate for the spheres. Uh, but if the wavelength is greater than this critical wavelength, then there is a positive growth rate for the spheres and the cylinder will evolve into spheres. Now, because of the geometry of this evolution process, uh, if the primary mechanism for the diffusion is along the surface, there is a maximum of the growth rate uh, of the spheres that occurs at this lambda sub max. Uh, and this, based on the geometry of the system, is equal to the square root of two times this critical lambda. So in other words, the square root of two times the circumference of the cylinder. Uh, so that would be the opt optimum perturbation wavelength to get this morphological evolution. On the other hand, if the primary transport mechanism is vapor transport, meaning that the atoms from the cylinder are vaporizing and then recondensing to form a sphere, then there's no maximum there. The, uh, the rate just continues to increase as the perturbation wavelength increases. Um, so that's the case of isotropic surfaces where there's no directionality in the properties. Uh, now, what about anisotropic materials where uh, the surface tension depends on which face of the crystal is exposed at the different interfaces? This, of course, is more complicated because there are additional degrees of freedom associated with these anisotropic crystals. And since different faces of the crystal have different contributions to the surface free energy, some inclinations of the crystal are less thermodynamically stable and will be replaced by other inclinations to lower the total free energy of the system. 
And this phenomenon leads to something that we call faceting. Uh, faceting is where there is some surface texturing that appears on the material, uh, on any anisotropic material, as a way to lower the overall surface energy of the system by exposing more area of the lower surface tension phases. And now this is clear from the formula of the Gibbs free energy associated with the facets that if you add up uh, the products of the surface tensions for each of the inclinations of the crystal multiplied by their areas, that gives you the total free energy. And we can bias this towards a lower overall free energy if the area of the lower surface tension faces um, is greater than the area of the higher surface tension uh, inclinations. And that's what leads to this um, faceting effect. And you can see this here. This is an example of faceted grains in an annealed alumina polycrystal. Uh, this is a three grain junction on the surface of a polycrystalline alumina sample after annealing. Um, and you can see the different types of surfaces that can present itself. Um, in this case, one, this is just one inclination. Uh, in case two here, you've got two facets being exposed. And in case three, there are three facets being exposed. Uh, of course, this all depends on the geometry of the grain and um, you know which direction that you're slicing this along in order to expose this um, surface. Uh, another phenomenon associated with anisotropy is that the spherical shape is not necessarily the most thermodynamically favorable. So for example, if we have grain growth of an initially spherical grain shown here in the middle, uh, but if this is an anisotropic grain that might grow uh, faster along the diagonal directions here and slower along the horizontal and vertical directions, that even though this grain is initially spherical, it's going to become non-spherical over time because the growth rate is uh, faster along certain directions compared to other directions. And um, you know, in this particular case where the growth rate is maximum along the diagonals, the fastest growing inclinations uh, end up accumulating at these 45 degree angles and form corners. Um, so this just shows that uh, you know, sphere is not necessarily the most thermodynamically favorable configuration uh, if you have anisotropy in your system. And similarly, we can have uh, an initially spherical grain here become non-spherical, not just from grain growth, but also from dissolution of the grains. So if the dissolution rate is different along different directions, even if this starts off as being initially spherical at time equals zero, after some longer time that can evolve into a non-spherical shape because of these differential dissolution rates along different directions. So whether it's growth or dissolution, anisotropy uh, can naturally lead to non-spherical shapes. Now, the next topic is that of particle coarsening. And this is a phenomenon that occurs if you have um, second phase particles that are embedded within some sort of matrix phase. So most of the material is a matrix phase, but then there are um, second phase particles that are distributed um, throughout that matrix. And those particles may have different sizes and of course, different positions. And there is a driving force for an overall coarsening of the particles, uh, which results from the ability of the system to reduce its total interfacial energy. And what this means is that if you've got particles having some distribution of sizes that are embedded in the matrix phase, there's going to be a net flux of matter from the smaller particles to the larger ones, leading to an increase of the average particle size. Or in other words, the material from the smaller particles on average is going to flow into the larger particles, which increases the size of the larger, larger particles at the expense of, of the smaller particles. So over time, the smaller particles will shrink and disappear and the larger particles will become dominant. Um, and this tendency for larger particles to grow at the expense of smaller ones acts to decrease the total interfacial energy in the system. 
Uh, this process of particle coarsening is also known, known as Oswald ripening, and this involves a net diffusion of material from the smaller to the larger particles, and the diffusion itself takes place through the matrix phase because these particles are separated from each other. Now, a common everyday example of this is actually uh, in ice cream. So if you leave ice cream uh, open and somehow it remains uneaten for a long period of time, uh, what you'll see is that um, the ice cream that starts off with a very nice smooth texture uh, becomes gritty over time. And that's because uh, ice cream has embedded ice crystals in it. Uh, initially, those ice crystals are relatively small, but over time, the ice crystals are growing and they grow through this particle coarsening mechanism or this Oswald ripening mechanism. And as the ice crystals become larger, they present that rougher texture to your mouth as you're eating the ice cream. So the ice cream over time um, has this grittier texture. And that's why it's important to always eat your ice cream quickly and don't let it sit around for too long. Uh, the Nittany Lion here knows this, so whenever he goes to the creamery, he's uh, sure to gobble up all the ice cream. Um, now, the most simple model to describe this particle coarsening process is this LSW model, or Lifshitz uh, Slyazov Wagner model, LSW theory of diffusion limited coarsening. And the underlying assumptions here are that um, the rate limiting process is the diffusion of the material through the matrix phase itself. So it's not a source limited or sink limited process, but rather a diffusion limited process. And it also assumes a dilute solution of particles distributed in the matrix phase. So there's a, a large separation between these particles. Um, if either of these assumptions is violated, then you need to go to a more complicated theory. But based on these simplified assumptions, LSW theory uh, shows that the rate of the average particle growth here, so this is the rate of, of growth of the cube of the average particle radius, so this would be a measure of the rate of growth of the average particle volume with respect to the initial particle volume, uh, is uh, so the volume is growing uh, linearly with time here. Uh, so there's a cubic dependence between the particle radius and time. And this depends on the diffusion coefficient of the material through the matrix phase, as well as the molar volume of the particle material and the solubility of the particle material in the matrix, um, because that governs how much of that material that the matrix can accommodate. Now, if instead of having um, particles that are separated in a matrix, what if you have um, kind of a, a fully dense polycrystalline material uh, made up of a bunch of different grains here? Um, the question becomes, how do the grain boundaries evolve over time? And grain growth is a kinetic process by which the average grain size of a polycrystalline material increases over time during an annealing process or during some sort of thermal treatment. Uh, this is actually a really complicated problem, but it becomes a lot easier if we consider it first in two dimensions. Uh, if we have two-dimensional grain growth, there's all types of things that can happen during um, the grain growth or the uh, grain boundary evolution process. Here on the upper left, this is an example of having four grains that are coming together at two vertices. And over time, one of these grain boundaries is disappearing, but it's forming a new grain boundary um, here in the horizontal direction. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, here we've got a three-sided grain that is surrounded by three other grains. And over time, these three outer grains are going to grow and end up consuming the grain that's in the middle. So overall, we have eliminated one of the grains from the material. Instead of three vertices, we have just one vertex here in the middle, and the total number of grains has reduced by one. In the lower left, it's the same type of thing, but now it, instead of a three-sided grain, it is a four-sided grain that is in the interior. That four-sided grain is surrounded by these four other grains. Over time, those outer grains will consume the inner grain, um, and so the overall grain size is increasing because it is eliminating one of the grains and also reducing the number of vertices from four to just 
two. Uh, the lower right shows um, the same type of thing, but where a five-sided grain disappears over time. Uh, so what is going on here? This actually relates to the curvature of the grain boundaries. And let us consider what if we can, if we have one isolated grain in the interior of a material and it has some sort of um, shape as shown here on the right. So over time, the way that, uh, that this grain boundary evolves is that the boundary is going to move into the curvature that is presented locally there. So if you've got this kind of concavity uh, to the curvature, this is going to act to, to straighten out that curvature. And so the grain boundary here is going to move into the direction of the curvature because if it moves into the direction of the curvature, that is acting to straighten out this grain boundary and eliminate the curvature. Uh, likewise, if you pick some other point on the grain uh, where the curvature now is convex, again, the motion of the grain boundary is going to be into the direction of the curvature, so it's actually going to shrink in this direction, uh, because if this grain boundary moves in this direction, that is acting to straighten out um, the grain boundary. So anywhere uh, you've got curvature, the direction of motion is going to be into the curvature. If there is this type of concavity, that's going to grow the grain along that direction. If there is convexity here, it's actually going to shrink the grain because the direction of motion is into the grain. Now, mathematically, we can describe this using the equation here on the left. This shows the change of the area of an internal grain over time. And this would be equal to uh, minus integrating over that entire grain boundary, where you've got the mobility of the grain boundary here. So that is the kinetics of how fast this uh, grain boundary can move, times the surface energy of the grain boundary. So that is our surface tension, uh, times uh, and then the, integ the um, uh, integral is over all the local angles here across the grain. And um, Basically, if you integrate this on average, that would go to um, either a net increase or a decrease of the area of the grain, depending upon how much of this grain boundary is uh, convex versus concave. Now, this leads to a uh, mathematically exact solution of the equation, which is called the von Neumann Mullins law. And this considers whether grains in a two dimensional polycrystalline isotropic material on average will grow or shrink as a function of the number of sides of those grains. So if the, if the grain has n sides, uh, we can write that integral of. Um, over all of the uh, grain boundaries as an integral over the different segments of each of the grain boundary segments. So this would be the integral over the first grain boundary plus the integral over the second grain boundary plus dot, dot, dot up to the nth grain boundary. And this, the solution to this is on average, um, this relates to uh, this delta theta factor, which is the equilibrium vertex angle um, with respect to uh, a normal, uh, a normal to the uh, the grain boundary uh, plane, and if you have a two dimensional system, let's say consider this vertex here, uh, at every vertex um, there are three grains that share that particular vertex. So you've got a grain here, a grain here, and a grain here, and of course it is three hundred sixty degrees or two pi radians around that entire vertex. And if that two pi radians is shared by three different grains, that means that, and, and also if this is isotropic, that means that uh, the angles here within the vertex are shared by three grains. That means that each angle at equilibrium would be two pi divided by three, or in other words, 120 degrees. And this delta theta is just um, you know pi minus that. So this delta theta is uh, pi over three or 60 degrees. And if we put that in and simplify this, we get the final form for the von Neumann Mullins law, which is the change of the area of the grain is equal to the mobility of the grain boundary times the surface tension times pi over three. And then the key part is this part here, n minus six, 
where n is the number of sides of the particular grain. So this um, von Neumann Mullins law is also called the n minus six law because what it's saying is that on average, whether a grain grows or shrinks depends on the number of sides to that grain. Um, so if you put in n greater than six, n greater than six is going to lead to a positive right-hand side to this equation, which means the area of a grain that has a number of sides greater than six is going to increase over time. That means a grain that has more than six sides is going to increase in area over time. On the other hand, if you have n less than six, this would be a, a grain that has fewer than six sides. That is going to give a negative right-hand side to this equation, which means that a grain that has fewer than six sides on average is going to shrink over time. So in other words, the grains that have a number of sides greater than six are going to grow, and they're going to grow at the expense of the grains that have fewer than six sides. And if the grain has exactly six sides, then it is um, stable. It's not going to change in size. Um, and the reason for this geometrically re relates back to the curvature of the system. So let's consider here uh, a two-sided grain. So the two-sided grain here has two vertices. Each vertex is shared by three grains. And the equilibrium angles around this vertex are 120 degrees. Now, if you have this, um, these two grain boundaries coming out with an angle of 120 degrees between them on this side and also on this side, the only way that you can make those grain boundaries meet to form a two-sided grain is if you introduce curvature to, of the system to give it this type of convexity to the shape. So in other words, the two-sided grain is going to have this lens shape uh, because geometrically it is forced to have this type of lens shape in order to um, make the two vertices meet while maintaining those 120 de degree grain boundaries. So that means that there's going to be convexity to these surfaces. The direction of the grain boundary motion is to straighten out the grain boundaries. So this right hand side is going to evolve into the grain because it's going to move in the direction that would straighten the grain boundaries, which is into the direction of the curvature. Likewise, the left-hand side here is going to evolve into the grain. And so over time, this two-sided grain is going to shrink and disappear. Same thing for the three-sided grain. On average, this is going to have convex grain boundaries in order to satisfy the geometrical conditions of 120-degree vertex angles and still achieve a three-sided grain. So on average, the three-sided grain is going to shrink. Um, same thing for a four-sided grain. Same thing for a five-sided grain. If you have a six-sided grain, uh, the hexagon is the geometry that uh, will give you exactly 120 degree bond angles with perfectly straight grain boundaries. So if you draw a hexagon with perfectly straight grain boundaries, all of those vertices geometrically will have the equilibrium 120 degree angles. And so that's why the n equals six grains, the hexagonal grains are stable. Now, if you go to grains that have more than six sides, for example, this is an n equals 11 grain, an 11-sided grain, now the opposite is true. So in order to maintain these 120-degree bond angles and uh, make the vertices uh, match up here, in order to get the 11-sided grain, on average, the curvature of the grain boundaries is going to be concave instead of convex. And that means as each of these individual bond uh, segments, um, or these green boundary segments uh, evolves, it's going to evolve into the curvature in order to straighten it out. Uh, the way to do that is to move outward, and that expands the grain. And that's why um, you know, grains that have greater than six number of sides on average are going to grow. Grains that have fewer than six, um, six sides are going to shrink on average. And that all relates back to whether uh, on average the grain boundaries have a convex curvature or a concave curvature. Now this uh, von Neumann Mullins law is applicable to grain boundary evolution in two dimensions. 
Uh, the problem of grain growth in three dimensions is considerably more difficult and remained unsolved for several decades after the work of von Neumann and Mullins. Um, that being said, at University of Pennsylvania, uh, two scientists, McPherson and Srolovitz, have recently solved uh, this problem, uh, not just for three dimensions, but for arbitrary dimensionality. And um, this shows a, an image from one of their papers here. You can see the references down at the bottom. On the right, this shows a, a three-dimensional uh, system of grains. And if you were to take um, planar slices through these or cross sections through uh, this three-dimensional polycrystal system, then you can get these two-dimensional slices. And the way that they formulate this problem is a generalization of the von Neumann's Mullins law for arbitrary dimensionality, where instead of the change of the area in two dimensions, this is the change of the d-dimensional volume of the grain. So how is that evolving with time? This relates back to the mobility of the grain boundaries and the surface tension as before, but the n minus six is actually replaced by uh, this geometric function, which is called the Hadwiger d minus two measure. It's effectively um, getting a local curvature of the system um, in the appropriate dimensionality for the system and then using that local curvature, st stating on average whether those grains are going to grow, which would give you a positive value here in the parentheses, or if they're going to shrink on average, which would be um, a negative value. So this is a, um, a generalization of the von neumanns mullins law uh, for arbitrary dimensionality. Now, uh, the next topic is that of diffusional creep. And if you have uh, not just the capillary forces acting, as we've just considered with grain growth, but a combination of capillary forces and applied external forces acting on the system, that can introduce changes to the overall macros macroscopic shape through a plastic deformation that is you know, caused by these external applied forces and also facilitated by the capillary forces internal to the material. Now, in a polycrystalline material, this process of plastic deformation in response to these external applied forces and facilitated by uh, capillary forces is known as creep or diffusional creep because the mechanism that facilitates this is a diffusion process. And this involves, this diffusional creep involves the diffusion of vacancies or other species to induce morphological changes that lead to a plastic deformation of the polycrystalline material. Now, there are two fundamental types of diffusional creep, and this depends on whether the mass flux um, to the grain boundaries or between the grain boundaries occurs via the crystalline matrix or along the grain boundaries themselves. If the diffusional mass flux occurs via the crystalline matrix, then the type of diffusional creep is called navarro herring creep. And if the mass flux occurs along the grain boundaries themselves, the process is known as cobalt creep. So it's navarro herring creep if the diffusion is through the crystalline matrix and cobalt creep if that diffusion is along the grain boundaries themselves. And for different types of systems, one can make these uh, deformation mechanism maps. This shows here as a function of the applied stress on the y-axis and the temperature on the x-axis. What are the dominant mechanisms of mechanical deformation? If you have a low stress at low temperatures, the response is predominantly elastic. Um, however, if you go to say higher temperature systems, uh, with higher stresses applied, you can have the onset of diffusional creep that leads to plastic deformation of the material. Um, the, in this example, the cobalt creep is activated at lower temperatures compared to the Nabarro herring creep because it takes higher temperatures for the diffusion to become, become dominant within the crystalline matrix as opposed to uh, along the grain boundaries themselves. Um, now, another type of um, morphological evolution, the last one that we're going to deal with in this lecture, is sintering. And sintering and diffusional creep have um, something in common in that they both result from the same underlying driving forces, 
which is a combination of capillarity and applied stresses. The difference is that sintering is associated with a permanent densification of a porous body, whereas diffusional creep does not necessarily involve uh, a densification of the system. With both processes, a driving force for mass transfer exists as a result of both the capillary and applied forces. And in both cases, this results in a flux of the diffusing species, which leads to some permanent deformation. In other words, a plastic deformation of the system. Um, both diffusional creep and sintering are assisted by going to elevated temperatures, which act to accelerate the diffusion kinetics. Um, the difference is that with sintering, we start off with a porous body that has a granular type of structure. Uh, this initial, what's called a green body, it's called a green body not because it's the color green, but because it is formed from some sort of compacted powders that haven't yet undergone um, the sintering treatment. Um, and that's why it's called the green body. And um, traditional sintering takes place through a solid state process that is a combination of thermal treatment. So this means going to elevated temperatures as well as pressurization, but without actually melting the material itself. So you expose this uh, granular green body to uh, some sort of um, compressive forces at, at high temperatures. And then the grain boundaries and the morphology evolve over time in order to eliminate the porosity from the system. That increases the density as uh, the sintering process evolves. It also increases the mechanical integrity of the system. So this improved structural integrity of the sintered body arises from densification and intergranular neck growth. Uh, this former here, densification, is the result of mass transport that reduces porosity, and the latter is the result of mass transport that increases the neck size between grains. Uh, the fundamental driving force for sintering is capillarity, which is a reduction of the total surface energy of the system, and that's supplemented by the applied pressure that creates compressive um, forces to eliminate porosity. Now, um, beyond the traditional solid state sintering, uh, it's also possible to design your system to have one phase that would melt at the sintering temperature, and that molten phase can act as a medium through which there can be viscous transport of the uh, diffusing species. This is what's called liquid phase sintering. And so if a material is difficult to sinter via the traditional solid state routes, liquid phase sintering can be utilized to have some molten phase. This would be a low melting temperature uh, phase that is added to the system that liquid phase would fill the pores upon melting and is chosen such that the solid phase has at least partial solubility in that molten liquid. Uh, this enables transport of the solid material into the pores by first dissolving into solution and then precipitating at the interfaces around the pore, thereby densifying the system. Now, the first mechanism at the initial stage of sintering uh, is what's called neck growth. If you have two grains that start off as spherical, shown here, over time, as the system compacts, uh, the area uh, that is touching between these two grains is going to increase over time, and uh, that leads to the formation of this neck between the materials. This is almost like a, a snowman here over time. And this process is called necking as the area here increases. Um, this contact area increases and that reduces the overall porosity in between these grains as well. And um, this involves the transport of material from different locations on the grains to the neck. So basically the material is being transported, filling in the neck area in order to increase this neck size. And there are various mass transport mechanisms that help facilitate this necking process. Uh, this table shows uh, some of them. And the code here is that the first letter indicates the source. So this is where the material is coming from. So if the material starts off at the surface, that is S here, the source is the surface. If it is B, then the source is the green boundary. If it's D, then the source is um, a dislocation. 
The second letter indicates the sink, where it's going to, which in the case of necking is always the surface. So you've got material that comes from different parts of the surface, grain boundaries, dislocations, but it's always ending up at the surface of the neck. And then there is a dot, and then the last letters here indicate the transport mechanism. So if it's XL, the transport mechanism is through uh, the crystal. If it's B, the transport mechanism is along the grain boundary. If it's S, the transport mechanism is surface diffusion. If it's V, the transport mechanism is uh, vapor transport. And this VF here just indicates viscous flow in the case of liquid phase sintering. So this one here, BS.XL, this is the transport mechanism where the uh, material starts off at a grain boundary, diffuses to the surface through the crystal. And you can see that here if we've got um, our two grains and uh, the neck growing between the two grains, this shows a, a little diagram that, that shows some of these mechanisms for this SS, SSXL is material that starts at the surface, diffuses to the surface, but does so through the crystal. If it's SSS, this is material that starts at the surface, diffuses to a different part of the surface along the surface. SSV would be material that vaporizes from the surface and then recondenses in a different point on the surface. This BSB is diffusion that occurs from the grain boundary to the surface along the grain boundary. BSXL is that it starts off at the grain boundary and diffuses to the surface along the crystal. This is uh, DSXL starting at a dislocation, diffusing to the surface through the crystal. So all of these mechanisms are possible and different mechanisms may be the dominant ones depending upon um, the particular parameters of your system. So just like we had a deformation mechanism map, we can also have sintering mechanism maps, which indicate what the primary mechanisms are for sintering along different conditions. In this case, this shows uh, temperature here along the x-axis and um, then along the y-axis here, this is the logarithm of the neck radius divided by the particle radius. So basically a geometry of how far along or how big the neck radius is relative to the particle radius. And um, this shows different regimes that may be active uh, or may be dominant depending upon where you are on this um, sintering mechanism map. Now, sintering can be thought of as uh, occurring along three different stages. The initial stage of sintering, also called stage one sintering, is dominated by neck growth. So this is starting off with, um, say, our initial powder compact and then uh, forming necks between the, uh, the grains that touch. Um, in this stage one, there's still a lot of open porosity of the system, and it's really dominated by neck growth. When we get to stage two, the intermediate stage of sintering, at this point, the necks between particles are no longer small compared to the particle radii, and the porosity is still interconnected, but rather than having like really open porosity, the porosity is mainly in the form of tubular pores along these three grain junctions. So the porosity is still for forming a continuous network through the body. It's just a much smaller radius compared to the initial stage. Um, then when you get to the final stage of sintering, stage three sintering, um, the connectivity of the porous network is broken off. So the interconnected tubular porosity along the grain junctions breaks up and leaves isolated pores, which means in stage three, it's no longer possible to have a pathway from one side of the material to the other side of the material by going through this maze of porosity because um, those interconnections have been broken off and you just have these isolated pores. Um, and then the ultimate goal of sintering would be to fully eliminate all the porosity and reach 100% of the theoretical density. In practice, you can never quite get to 100%, but the goal is um, ultimately elimination of this porosity entirely. Now, one of the most exciting areas of research in sintering is done right here at Penn State, and that is called cold sintering. This is a process that uh, was invented by Professor Clive Randall. Uh, he has been working in this area for a long time and is doing all kinds of exciting research to figure out 
how we can reduce the temperature that is required for um, sintering. Now, the problem with sintering is that uh, traditional sintering requires high temperatures, which means that it's expensive and that it uses a lot of energy. Uh, and what Dr. Randall is doing is coming up with processes that enable sintering to occur several hundred degrees Celsius below traditional sintering processes. He's taking advantage of both um, higher applied pressures as well as uh, chemical reactions that can occur in the material to help facilitate the sintering process even at much lower temperatures. Um, this shows some results from a, a recent PhD graduate from Penn State from Dr. Randall's group, uh, Sun Hui Bong, who went through this materials kinetics class a few years ago. And uh, what this shows is two different conditions here for traditional sintering in red versus cold sintering in blue. This traditional sintering is up to a temperature of 1,000 degrees C. And you can see this um, the density here that starts off with the original porous density of about 65% increasing up to you know maybe 97 percent or so of its theoretical density um, compared to the cold sintering process at a temperature of one, only 150 degrees c here the sintering uh, can achieve a little over 90 percent so it's not not quite as dense as traditional sintering but the temperature has been reduced by 850 degrees c so it is a really big deal um, so there's a lot of great research going on, which should provide a means to um, not only lower the cost, but improve the um, or lower the environmental impact associated with the sintering processes. So to summarize this chapter 11, uh, interfacial free energy is the product of the interfacial area and the surface tension. Uh, morphological evolution occurs uh, as a result of capillary forces and applied forces. Uh, they want to act to lower the overall free energy of the system. For isotropic surfaces, they want to evolve in such a way to eliminate the gradient of surface curvature. If you've got anisotropic surfaces, that can lead to uh, faceting and other non-spherical shapes. Uh, coarsening of um, particles occurs uh, through Oswald ripening. Uh, the typical uh, theory assumes that it is uh, diffusion limited. Uh, if you've got polycrystalline materials, the in two dimensions, the grain growth uh, occurs following that von Neumann's Mullins law or the N minus six law. Uh, we can also have diffusional creep, which is a combination of capillary forces and applied forces. There are two types of diffusional creep, depending upon if the mass flux occurs through the crystalline matrix, which is Namaro herring creep, or if the mass flux occurs along the grain boundaries, which is cobalt creep. And uh, the finally, finally here, we've got sintering, which is a way of increasing the density of a system by re eliminating its porosity or reducing its porosity. And that also involves a combination of applied forces and capillary forces. Uh, so next time, we are going on to chapter 12, which is diffusion in polymers and glasses. Um, so until then, thanks so much for listening, and I will see you next time.